yeah, thank you for inviting me here. Um, as I said, my name is Monica Heshley's. I'm the volunteer program manager um, over at Johnson Creek Watershed Council. I've been there about a year. Um, so um, some faces look kind of familiar from the neighborhood and the church. Um, our office is in the Los Angeles Church, for those that don't know that. Um, we're out on the second floor up there, um, kind of hiding. But um, yeah, so thanks for the invitation to come here and talk a little bit about Johnson Creek, Watershed Council, and also beavers. Um, I'll start by saying I am not an expert on beavers, um, but I think they are super cool. And um, the more I learn about them, the more excited I, I get. And um, so I can give a little bit of information and also give some resources on um, other places to start looking if you want more information. And you can definitely get into a rabbit hole with, with beavers. Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about the council, um, some information about beavers, where we're seeing beavers in Johnson Creek, and um, also some opportunities if you want to get more involved with Johnson Creek Watershed Council. Like I mentioned, put together some resources to learn more and then opportunity for questions. But if you have any questions, you know, we're not a huge group, so feel free to um, interrupt me and I will do my best to answer them. Um, so I uh, guess, show of hands if you are familiar with Johnson Creek. I'm not too far from it, so I expect most people are familiar. Great. Um, well, Johnson Creek, it runs 26 miles. It starts out in boring and uh, meets up with the Willamette in Milwaukee. Um, so it's a very urban creek. And with that, there's a lot of opportunities for great habitat, but also a lot of challenges. Um, so the Watershed Council started in 1995 with a community-led organization. Um, now, many years later, um, there's eight staff there. And our mission is to do the restoration and stewardship of Johnson Creek, um, both through community engagement and also um, using sound science to do restoration. That kind of looks like three big programs that we have. Um, we have our like volunteer community engagement program. Um, so we have opportunities for community members to come um, maybe plant native plants, remove um, non-native plants, uh, we just had our big Johnson Creek cleanup where we got into the creek and pulled out 6.5 tons of trash. Um, so that was really exciting. And um, we also have some educational events like bring talks like this, where we have sometimes pub talks over at Double Mountain Brewing. Um, we've got some other educational events in September um, that I'll talk about at the end. Lots of ways to get involved in just trying to um, get the community knowledgeable about Johnson Creek and um, able to, to contribute to a uh, healthy habitat for us and other creatures like beavers. Um, we also have our recurring program, so that um, focuses primarily on private with private landowners. Um, kind of similar things, removing invasive plants and planting native plants, adding more shade to the riparian corridor. Um, and then our restoration program, uh, we have a lot of different projects like removing fish um, fish barriers, like old culverts and replacing them. Um, we've got some stormwater projects going on right now. We're removing pavement to help with um, filtration, you know, filtering out some of those pollutants before they go into Johnson Creek. Um, that's one project that is a little more like upland in a watershed. Um, most of our projects are more along the stream. Um, so in a watershed, anything that's falling within that watershed eventually is going to end up in Johnson Creek. Um, in the past, our efforts have made them right along the creek in what we call the riparian corridor. Um, but now we're starting to think about what it looks like to have an impact a little bit like upland from that area. Um, so a little bit about beavers. Um, beavers once lived all over North America. 
Africa. Um, so they have a huge impact on what that landscape looks like. And um, since the fur trade and also um, castorium, which is a comes from a gland on Peter's butt, so it's used in perfume. Um, so primarily, I think that was more a trade in Europe, um, but in North America, beavers were hunted um, for cats. Um, so populations are now down to between six and 12 million from 60 to 400 million. Um, so we're really seeing changes in our landscape um, from that reduction in beaver population and talk a little bit more about that. Um, Beavers are not super social animals, but they do typically mate for life, and young will stay with parents for two to three years. Um, they are built to live in the water. They've got webbed feet. Um, they have very du a double layer of fur that helps them um, stay insulated in the water. They also have two pairs of lips, essentially, one behind their teeth and one in front of their teeth so that they can chew underwater. So um, here it doesn't freeze, but in areas where it does freeze, um, they can actually store food underwater over the winter. And then um, they'll release, they can make a leak in their dam to release water and create an air pocket um, so that they can live under the ice. So I thought that was pretty cool. neat. Yeah. Um, we'll see some pictures of their uh, of their dams and their lodges, but they create um, these dams so that they can create more water because they are a lot more nimble in the water for some rain. So now they have created more habitat for themselves where they are going to be able to evade predators um, even more. And um, a lot of times they will stay in one pond if there's resources, but if those resources start um, to be depleted, they may change their home base. They also, they eat um, the bark from trees and also other vegetation. If they're not eating that in their way, but sometimes if you see a big beaver chew, you'll see like little kind of chips um, as they knock down that space. So when we're thinking about beavers' impact on the landscape, you know, I mentioned they build these dams to create more water so that they can build their lodges in the center of it. Um, their lodges actually, um, the entrance to it is underwater, so that also helps them, you know, evade predation and, and be safer. But as they're flooding these landscapes, um, they're creating habitat for other species. So we think of them as being a keystone species. And I put that image there because um, I didn't always have that image of what a keystone is, but like in an arch, it's that like final block that holds everything together. And, and that's really what beavers do. Um, so they, you know, they help create wetlands. And um, as I mentioned up there, wetlands help filtrate water. Um, they can help mitigate flood and um, help with droughts, help with fire mitigation, and also create habitat for many different species from birds, amphibians, um, ungulates, all sorts of things that are like dependent on these species. I listened to a podcast recently um, and they were talking about how we think of wolves as being the keystone species in Yellowstone. Um, but there's some research that shows that it's actually because of wolves controlling the population of ungulates, which then provide more habitat for beavers, and beavers are the ones that are actually having a bigger impact on the environment um, because they're able, they're creating this like water shortage in the landscape, um, it creates more left habitat. Um, so really important for like our environment. Um, I put this video in here because it's kind of fun to see them and um, where we're going to so I'll just share it in about five minutes. Um, let's see, can you, do I need to turn up the volume? I think you have to choose to share your volume from the presentation under share. Sure. Okay. I think there's an option menu. 
It says share audio. Let me just try that. It wouldn't be your back. Okay. You thought was ordinary and show you why it's extraordinary. Today, I'm in Alaska, and you're never gonna look at beavers the same way again. Okay, so what do most people know about beavers? They chew down trees, they build dams, but what most people don't know is that without beavers, North America and much of the world would be completely different than it is today. Beavers are one of the ultimate keystone species, a plant or animal that's so important to an ecosystem that without it, it would basically break. The dams and the bodies of water they create provide habitats for dozens of species. They filter and purify water. They add nutrients to the soil through sediment and all of this rotting vegetation. They modify this landscape to such a degree that not a single species in the area escapes their effect. Earth is home to two beaver species today, one in Europe and these here in North America. They're rodents, the second biggest rodents on Earth. And like most rodents, they have big front teeth that never stop growing. But beaver teeth are reinforced with iron and they use those with powerful jaw muscles to chew down trees. But in addition to being carpenters, they're also plumbers. The sound of running water drives beavers nuts. They know the dam has sprung a leak and they have an uncontrollable instinct to come patch it up. Don't you? Beavers are ecosystem engineers, second only to humans. And they stay pretty damn busy keeping this pond nice and full. Sure, their constructions can cause a few headaches for us, but no beavers can be an even bigger problem. Before European colonists arrived, there were as many as 400 million beavers in the US and Canada. North America was covered with tens of millions of beaver dams. Imagine between five and 30 beavers on every kilometer of stream or river on the whole continent. That's a lot of beavers. But over a few hundred years, they were almost hunted to extinction. Beavers were big business. They were trapped for fur, mostly to make hats, but also for sacks on their butts full of castorium, a pungent substance used in perfumes. The British Hudson's Bay Company even tried to eradicate beavers from the Pacific Northwest, figuring with no beavers left to hunt, the United States would stop its westward expansion. Wherever pioneers went, they killed every beaver they could find, despite the fact that beavers were responsible for most of the farmland in the West. Populations dwindled from millions to the low thousands. Without beaver dams, huge areas of land are left with less water. Hundreds of species are left without a habitat. So that's great for other species, but what's in it for the beavers? Why do they build these? Well, for beavers, the ponds created by their dams are a place to build a home called a lodge. They can raise their young, keep away from predators, because they might be awkward on land, but they are masters in the water. The entrance to a beaver lodge is underwater, so beavers can safely scoot in and out. Since they don't hibernate, this lets them access underwater food stores, even when their ponds are frozen over. Beavers' favorite foods are the leaves and soft outer bark of trees, but like most mammals, they don't digest wood very well, so they eat their excrement to get the most out of a meal, until it eventually comes out looking like sawdust. A crew of beavers spotted in a pond is usually a family. Beaver couples often mate for life, and beaver kits live with their parents for a couple years while they practice their engineering skills. The oldest dams ever discovered are 100,000 years old, telling us beavers have been altering our landscape since before we moved in. And for most of the thousands of years we've lived together, we've lived in harmony. Now that we've realized how important they are, humans are helping beaver populations recover. More beavers means more homes for fish and birds, fresher water, and less damage from floods and forest fires. 
Many First Nations peoples feature beavers prominently in their oral histories, even in their creation myths, which is pretty neat because they really have molded the landscape under our feet. And it goes to show you just how old and special our relationship is with the smartest thing in fur pants. Stay curious. Um, I'm not sure, but I can add that link to the And someone else found that video that I thought they did a really good job of um, just like summing up some of that information. And also it's fun to see some of those images and, and see them in action. Um, so yeah, thinking a little bit about like, so Johnson Creek Watershed Council is working to do restoration um, they're certainly not the only organizations that are doing that. Um, and beavers are like the ultimate ecosystem engineer. They do a lot of the things that um, humans are trying to do to restore habitat um, on their own. They've been doing that, um, you know, their time in the morning. So um, looking to, there's been a lot of movements to like start looking towards beavers um, to help with those projects. Um, so as I mentioned, um, habitat restoration, um, wildfire suppression, um, beavers do that work for you. So um, some, it's not something we're doing in Johnson Creek. Um, being in an urban environment, there definitely are challenges, which we can talk a little bit more about. Um, but um, in other areas, they're actually like reinforcing the beaver dams um, and encouraging them with planting different things um, to bring them in so that they can have that impact from a land safe without, you know, spending millions of dollars to have the humans bring in large pieces of oil or things like that. Um, so one of the things we do at John McCree Watershed Council, we have a variety of different um, community science Projects and beaver surveys are one of those. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about why we're doing that in Johnson Creek. Um, because we do have a lot of different projects. Um, some places, you know, you want to attract beavers more than other, or you want to be thinking about how beavers are going to have an impact on that project. Um, so it might change our planting list if we know that beavers are in the area. Um, an example of that would be um, if we know it's an area with lots of beavers and maybe um, we, you know, it's fine for them to be there, but you still want these plants to get established. Um, things like willow, which they really like to eat, um, we might put cages in until that willow can get established. Once the willow is established, um, it actually does really well being browsed by beavers and it will help the willow to grow even more. Um, and, and send out lots of different shoots. So knowing there's beavers in that area, we know to protect them for the first couple of years, and then it's going to help to shape the creek later. Um, we're also doing these surveys, which are primarily looking for dams and lodges. Beavers are most active in the early mornings and at dusk. Um, so you're probably not that likely to see um, a beaver during the day when these surveys are happening. Um, but we're looking to see if they're returning every year, um, learning about how populations might be fluctuating, um, starting to do some research on relationships between beaver activity and um, when we're seeing other species in the creek, such as salmon, which is definitely a target species. Um, there is salmon in Johnson Creek, if you didn't know that. Um, so people are surprised, so protecting that habitat and um, beavers are important for that. Um, and having volunteers helps increase our capacity and um, just contribute to the community's knowledge of natural areas. Um, as I mentioned, looking mostly for the dams and lodges. Um, so um in you know in a non 
maybe wild isn't the right term, but in a non-urban area, you might see these more expansive dams um, going across this you know, large body of water. Um, in an urban area, that's probably not what you're going to find. Um, going to look a little less robust. Um, might see there might be grass growing on or trash stuck in it. So um, might be a little more challenging to recognize, but there are beaver dams in um, Johnson Creek and some of the other tributaries. So definitely keeping an eye out. Um, you can also look for other signs of beavers. You know, an obvious one is um, the chewed trees, um, but they also make these slide marks where they are going into the into the creek or other body of water. Um, you might also find some chewed sticks around. Um, they like to strip off the, the bark because that's um, part of what they like to eat. Um, they also make these scent mounds, um, and the mounds are piles of mud and smaller sticks and leaves, and they um, mix that castoreum with urine to mark the mounds when they're looking for meat or to show that they um, have occupied an area. Um, apparently, the female um, scent smells like motor oil, and the male scent smells more like the milk. I haven't tested wow. that. <laughs> it smells like what? Vanilla. Oh, motor oh, oh. oil and vanilla. Hey, thanks. <laughs> they're, they're called scent numbers. People are scent, like, yeah. <laughs> um, so, one area that does have a lot of beaver activity and is not too far from here. Um, is Errol Heights. And from what I understand about that project, um, beavers have drastically altered what that environment looks like. And this is also a really good example of um, a place where it's appropriate to have beavers in an urban environment. Um, but in order for that to be successful, there have been some different steps taken to make sure that we can live harmoniously, our roads aren't gonna get flooded, um, things like that. And um, so what they've done at Errol Heights is install things that I've heard called beaver deceivers. And basically they're piping that they put in um, that can go either like under or over a, a beaver dam. Um, and it's got a cage around the front of it. So it allows the water to drain out of the pond a little bit so it only gets to a certain height um, and then the beavers can't build around it because it has that cage caging so they're not able to block it up. Um, I think it still is some push and pull there, um, you know, still challenges, but that's one thing that um, people have created so that we live more harmoniously with beavers so we can keep introducing them into our landscape um, and so they can provide those ecosystem um, benefits that they do provide. That's most of what I have to say about beavers. Um, I also want to share that some other ways to get involved um, with Johnson Creek Watershed Council. Um, as I mentioned, we do have community science projects, um, and that's definitely a favorite way for a lot of people to get involved. You're learning a little more about these groups of animals. Um, it's also a way to get a little more like intimate connection to the creek. You get in the, for a lot of them, you're able to like get in the creek, um, put on waders, and um, get to experience that. Um, so beaver surveys are going on right now. Um, Salmon surveys will start in October, and that's going to be in Crystal Springs this year. That's where we primarily are seeing salmon carcasses. Um, salmons do exist in other parts of the creek, but the times of year that they're there, the water is very curved. It's very um, hard to see with all the sediment in there. Um, so we're focusing our um, surveys in Crystal Springs where you're more likely to see them with your, with your eye. Um, we also have amphibian AMAS surveys in January, bird surveys in April, and dragonfly surveys in June. So just Johnson Creek watershed people do the surveys? Um, volunteers, yes. 
So this is a volunteer opportunity. Yeah. Usually you have about like 30 to 50 volunteers per um, project. So you come to an orientation and then you learn about the survey protocol and the species that that was a good question. Thank you for clarifying. We learn a little bit about the species and the protocol for doing the survey, and then you get to go actually see if what you can find out there. Mm -hmm. We usually do like really big outreach uh, projects with the work for signing up to those workshops or volunteer hours. Um, the best way to find out about them is by signing up for our newsletter, which is on our website. Um, or all of them get listed on the website. Um, depending on the community science is not very popular, and so people kind of know to look for them. So we don't do as much outreach um, for those as maybe some of our other projects. Um, so definitely the newsletter. Definitely signing up for the newsletter is the best way to find out. Thank you. <laughs> What's the time commitment for the So yeah, that's a great question. It depends on the object. So beaver surveys, for example, um, you're just committing to one survey which I think is about three hours. Um, so you have to come to the training, which was also, it was probably four hours and then the three hour survey. Um, some of the other surveys you're going out like three or four times throughout the season um, for one or two hours. So it just depends on which project it is. And usually that information is listed on the kind of page when you um, look at the orientation. Um, some other things we have going on this month, um, we're doing something called Jossie Creek Days, kind of like an end of summer celebration. So we have three educational events. Um, they're all somewhat close to this area. Um, on September 12th, which is next Tuesday, we'll have a restoration project bike tour. And so this is an opportunity to get on your bike and learn a little bit about some different restoration projects, including um, Carroll Heights, Hyden Johnson, and West Northern Park, I believe. Um, and then Crystal Springs Partnership is offering a walking tour um, to get to learn a little more about some of the projects that have happened in Crystal Springs. And um, we'll also have a science in the park event, which is a great one for youth and families to come to. We're going to be partnering with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. They're going to they have this really cool trailer that has like a Pacific Northwest stream painted on it, and they're going to have a casting clinic and learn about some fish ID. And then we'll also have our salmon obstacle course set up and um, we plant little native plants and take them home to Lima. As kids, no as kids, that's going to be a really fun event. Is that a small park? It's at um, Milwaukee Riverfront Park, oh. but kind of like on the other side by the um, wastewater treatment facility. So um, that's all on our website. And then um, the last thing I just want to mention is we have like monthly habitat enhancement events. Um, starting in November, once the construction is done, the third Saturday of every month will be at Arrow Heights doing some different projects. So if you want to try to see some beavers, um, those are good ones to check out. Um, likely, uh, there may be a tour happening in October. I'm not sure yet if it will be in time. Um, and then we're also at Penn Johnson, which is not too far from here, the first Saturday of most months and um, out of Beach Botanical Garden, which is a little bit further east, but a beautiful spot and we have um, a very unique restoration project there that's not open to the public. And um, so if you're interested, um, those are kind of our regular ones. Um, but like I mentioned, the newsletter and our website are the best way to find out what's going on um, week to week, months and months. Uh, the last thing I want to put up is like, like I mentioned, I'm not an expert on beavers. There's a lot of information out there. And um, so I put just some that I have started looking at and found really interesting. Um, if you scan that QR code, it hopefully will take you to a Google Doc, um, which will have the links for um, the links for all of those. 
and then you can, you can check those out. Like I said, just somewhere to, to get started if you want to learn more. Um, if you're not familiar with Oregon Field Guide, it's an OPB program and they have a ton of different topics, all like central to Oregon and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I actually found out about it from my like, family at an event and I think it's super cool. So I learned um, And yeah, that's everything I have. Any questions? So do you know of any beavers besides the ones in the Errol Heights that are around this area? Um, there definitely are other spots. I think Errol Heights is the best publicly um, visible beavers that I know of in Johnson Creek. Um, I did hear from a volunteer that they see beavers in the Willamette, like I think north of Ross Island almost nightly. So um, that's a spot I've heard about, um, but I don't know of any other active beavers at this time. Like I said, our beaver surveys are just getting started. So um, hopefully we can share that information if we found out about other ones that are easy to get to the public. Yeah. I know there used to be beavers down in the Reed Canyon. I don't know if, I don't know what the status of that is. Yeah, I'm not sure either, mm -hmm. but that does seem like a place that would be great for them. They were taking down trees and things for a while. Mm -hmm. So I think they got um, kicked out for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Relocation. <laughs> but they may be there. Okay. Yeah, well, if anyone finds any beavers, definitely send me an email. I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> There's a beaver family that lives in the, I volunteer at Oregon Humane Society. Yeah. And down on their dog path, who's kind of And there's a beaver family that lives there. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> have, have you ever seen any there? Um, I've seen them at work. Yeah. I, I, I've seen them. I find some people that come to live in the room. Yeah, it's pretty unusual. We had to, to you know, try to put up a fence and they had to put wire around it because they kept shooting out the wood. Volunteer email. Um, my email is monica at jcwc.org. Do you know the interaction between beavers and coyotes? I think beavers or coyotes will eat beavers. So that's one thing, you know, why they take refuge in their ponds that they built. Coyotes are not as suited for water travel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just wondering because a few years back we heard about the coyote project and we have an increase in urban coyotes. And there was this one that was riding the trimet regularly. <laughs> um, and so I, I'm just wondering, you know, what that kind of interaction is. But yeah, I know the cats and dogs are missing sometimes from the neighborhood. So yeah, I would imagine it has a similar impact. Maybe they're not as easy of a prey mm -hmm. um, if, you know, they have their <laughs> suitable habitat um, as some of those dogs and cats may be. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know the specifics about that. Great question. Sometimes the uh, Oregon, the Portland Zoo has some really good, they have the beavers back in the zoo and they have their own little den. And there's like a window and sometimes they put really cute video content on their Instagram. So <laughs> More questions or comments? What was that? I would say thank you. <laughs>